Our journey begins over 5,000 years ago, when the first roots of what would become Frisian and Dutch were planted in the linguistic family known as Proto-Indo-European. Imagine the vast grasslands of the Pontic Caspian Steppe, a region that stretched between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. It was here, around 400 to 300 BCE, that the Proto-Indo-Europeans lived. They were nomadic people, primarily herders and farmers, and they spoke a language that no longer exists but has left a powerful legacy in the form of many of today's languages. Proto-Indo-European wasn't just the ancestor of Frisian and Dutch, but also of Latin, Greek, Sanskrit, and nearly every language spoken across Europe and large parts of Asia today. Over time, as these Proto-Indo-European people began to migrate westward into Europe, their language split into several distinct branches. One of these branches was the Germanic branch, which would give birth to languages like English, German, Danish, and, of course, Frisian and Dutch. By approximately 2000 BCE, these Proto-Germanic tribes had settled across Scandinavia and northern Germany. It was in these lands, where dense forests met rugged coastlines, that the early ancestors of both the Frisians and the Dutch began to take shape. They spoke a dialect of Proto-Germanic, which was still closely connected to other Germanic languages. But over time, their language began to diverge from other Germanic groups as they settled in different regions. This early linguistic history is crucial to understanding how Frisian and Dutch developed later on. Proto-Germanic, from which both languages would later evolve, began as a single language spoken by many different tribes, but geography, migration, and cultural exchange would soon cause the language to split into different dialects. We now shift our focus to the northwestern edge of Europe, along the North Sea coast. By around 500 BCE, a group of Proto-Germanic-speaking tribes had begun to settle along the coastal areas of what is now the Netherlands, Denmark, and northern Germany. These tribes would eventually form the Frisians, Saxons, and Angles, each with their own dialect of the Proto-Germanic language. These dialects would later give rise to Old Frisian and Old Dutch. This period marks the very beginning of the linguistic divergence that would eventually lead to the Frisian and Dutch languages as we know them today. The landscape was harsh, but these early Germanic-speaking peoples thrived by relying on farming, fishing, and trade. Their languages evolved to meet the needs of their daily lives, shaped by the isolation of the coastal marshlands and the interaction with neighboring tribes. By the time we reach the first century BCE, northern Europe was populated by numerous Germanic tribes. Among them were the early Frisians, a people who had settled along the coastal lowlands of the North Sea, from what is now Friesland in the Netherlands all the way across northern Germany to the Jutland Peninsula in Denmark. These early Frisians were skilled traders and seafarers, taking advantage of their position along the North Sea coast to establish trade routes with neighboring tribes and even the distant Roman Empire. During this period, the language spoken by the Frisians and their neighbors was still part of the larger family of West Germanic dialects. It bore many similarities to the languages spoken by the Saxons, Angles, and other Germanic tribes. These groups were not isolated from one another, rather, they were connected through trade, migration, and cultural exchange, which allowed their languages to remain relatively similar for several centuries. This was also the time of the Roman expansion into Europe. While the Roman Empire never fully conquered the northern Frisian territories, their influence was felt. In the southern parts of the Low Countries, the Roman legions encountered the Batavians, a Germanic tribe that lived along the lower Rhine River in what is now the Netherlands. The Batavians, who became Roman allies, played a crucial role in the early development of the Dutch language. The Batavians adopted many aspects of Roman culture, including the use of Latin in administration and trade. Latin began to influence the Germanic dialects spoken by the Batavians, introducing new vocabulary and concepts related to law, governance, and religion. This early Latin influence would become a key factor in the development of Old Dutch in the centuries to come. Meanwhile, the Frisians to the north remained largely outside of Roman influence.
they continued to speak their native Germanic dialect, which was closely related to the languages spoken by the Anglo-Saxons across the North Sea in what is now England. The isolation of the Frisian territories allowed their language to develop along a separate path from the Latin-influenced dialects of the South. By the 5th century CE, as the Roman Empire began to crumble, Europe entered a period of great upheaval known as the Migration Period. Germanic tribes, including the Frisians, Saxons, and Angles, moved across the continent in search of new lands. While the Angles and Saxons migrated to Britain, where they would lay the foundation for the English language, the Frisians remained in their coastal homeland, continuing to develop their language and culture in relative isolation. The language spoken by the Frisians during this period was still quite similar to that of their Anglo-Saxon neighbours. Old Frisian and Old English shared many features, both grammatically and lexically, as they had descended from the same Proto-Germanic roots. However, as the Frisians became more settled in their coastal territories, their language began to develop its own unique characteristics. While the Frisians maintained their independence in the north, the southern part of the Netherlands was undergoing significant political and linguistic changes. In the 5th century, the Frankish tribes began to assert their dominance over the region. The Franks, who had originally come from the area around the lower Rhine River, expanded their territory across much of what is now France, Belgium, and the southern Netherlands. Their conquest of the Roman province of Gallia Belgica marked the beginning of a new era for the southern Low Countries. The Franks established the Merovingian dynasty, and under their rule, the Germanic dialect spoken in the southern Netherlands began to evolve into what we now call Old Dutch. The Franks, like the Batavians before them, were heavily influenced by Latin, particularly through their contact with the Roman Catholic Church. As Christianity spread across the Frankish kingdom, Latin became the language of the church, administration, and law. This Latin influence was particularly strong in the urban centres of the southern Netherlands, where the Frankish elite adopted Latin for official purposes. However, the common people continued to speak their native Germanic dialects, which gradually absorbed Latin vocabulary and grammatical structures. Over time, these dialects evolved into Old Dutch, a language that retained its Germanic roots but was shaped by centuries of Latin influence. By the 8th century, the Frankish ruler Charlemagne had consolidated his power over much of Western Europe, including the southern Netherlands. Under Charlemagne's rule, Latin became even more entrenched as the language of the elite, while Old Dutch continued to be spoken by the common people. The development of Old Dutch was heavily influenced by the political and cultural dominance of the Franks, and it began to diverge more significantly from the Frisian language spoken to the north. At the same time, the Frisians were experiencing their own political challenges. In 734 CE, the Frankish ruler Charles Martel defeated the Frisians at the Battle of the Born, bringing much of Friesland under Frankish control. This defeat marked the end of Frisian political independence and the beginning of a period of Frankish influence over Frisian society. However, despite this political domination, the Frisian language continued to thrive, especially in rural areas where the influence of Latin was less pronounced. The 8th and 9th centuries were marked by the spread of Christianity across the Low Countries, a process that had a profound impact on both Frisian and Dutch. Missionaries, such as St. Willibrord and St. Boniface, travelled to Friesland and the southern Netherlands, converting the local populations to Christianity and establishing monasteries and churches throughout the region. With Christianity came the Latin language. Latin was the language of the church, and many of the earliest written texts in both Frisian and Dutch were religious in nature. The spread of Christianity introduced new religious vocabulary into both languages, much of which was borrowed directly from Latin. This period saw the introduction of Latin words for concepts like church, from Latin ecclesia, bishop, from Latin episcopus, and priest, from Latin presbyter. In Friesland, the Christianization process was slower and more contested. The Frisians had long resisted conversion, and the region remained a stronghold of paganism well into the 8th century. However, after their defeat by the Franks, the Frisians were gradually brought into the Christian fold. Monasteries were established, and Latin began to influence the Frisian language, 
particularly in religious contexts. In the southern Netherlands, the Christianization process was more rapid, and Latin had a much more profound influence on the development of Old Dutch. The monasteries of Flanders and Brabant became centers of learning and literacy, and many religious texts were written in both Latin and Old Dutch. These texts provide some of the earliest written examples of the Dutch language and offer valuable insights into the linguistic changes that were taking place during this period. By the 9th and 10th centuries, the linguistic divergence between Frisian and Dutch had become more pronounced. This period marks the point where we can begin to speak of two distinct languages, Old Frisian and Old Dutch. Both languages were evolving out of the larger West Germanic family, but the political, geographical, and cultural differences between the Frisian and Dutch-speaking regions caused them to develop in separate directions. Old Frisian was primarily spoken along the northern coast of what is now the Netherlands and Germany, in an area that stretched from the Zuiderzee, modern-day Ijaselmeer, to the Wadden Sea, and beyond. The Frisian people were known for their independence and maritime prowess, and their language reflected their distinct cultural identity. Old Frisian was closely related to Old English, as both languages had their roots in the Germanic dialect spoken by the Angles, Saxons, and Jutes. Old Frisian had a relatively straightforward grammar, with a rich system of inflections for verbs, nouns, and adjectives, similar to Old English. The language also retained many of the features of the older Germanic languages, including a strong reliance on word order and case endings to indicate grammatical relationships. For example, the word burn in Old Frisian meant the child, while burn in Old English also meant child. These similarities made the two languages mutually intelligible for a time. On the other hand, Old Dutch was spoken primarily in the southern regions of the Low Countries, including present-day Flanders, Brabant, and parts of modern-day Belgium. It was heavily influenced by the Latin spoken by the Roman Catholic Church, and many Latin loanwords had been incorporated into the language. The development of Old Dutch was closely tied to the political and cultural dominance of the Frankish rulers, who controlled much of the region. Old Dutch was somewhat less conservative than Old Frisian, meaning that it had begun to lose some of the complex inflectional endings that characterized the older Germanic languages. This process, known as linguistic simplification, was driven in part by the increasing use of Latin as the language of administration and religion. Latin grammar, which did not rely as heavily on inflectional endings, influenced the structure of Old Dutch, leading to a gradual reduction in the complexity of its noun and verb forms. Despite these differences, both Old Frisian and Old Dutch retained many of the core features of their Germanic roots. They were both written in runic script during the early Middle Ages, though Latin script gradually replaced runes as Christianity spread across the region. Some of the earliest written texts in both languages date from this period, providing valuable insights into the grammar, vocabulary, and syntax of Old Frisian and Old Dutch. One of the most important sources of information about Old Frisian is the body of legal texts known as the Frisian Laws. These texts, written in Old Frisian, provide a detailed account of the legal and social structure of Frisian society during the early medieval period. They also offer a glimpse into the linguistic characteristics of Old Frisian, including its rich system of noun declensions and verb conjugations. In the South, Old Dutch was also beginning to appear in written form, though much of the written material from this period was still in Latin. The oldest known sentence in Dutch, written in the year 1100, is found in a document known as the Salic Law, a legal code that was written in Latin but contains a short passage in Old Dutch. This passage, which reads Malvothi Afrio Lito, I say to you, I free you, Surf, is one of the earliest examples of written Dutch and shows the influence of Latin on the structure and vocabulary of the language. The Viking Age, roughly 800 to 1100 CE, had a profound impact on much of northern Europe, including the Frisian territories. The Vikings, who came from Scandinavia, frequently raided the coastal regions of the North Sea, including the Frisian Islands and the Southern Netherlands. These raids caused significant disruption to Frisian society, and many Frisian settlements were destroyed or abandoned during this period. <laughs>
the Viking influence on the Frisian language was relatively limited compared to the impact they had on other regions, such as England, where Old English absorbed many Norse loanwords. However, the Vikings did leave their mark on Frisian place names and vocabulary. Words related to seafaring, trade, and warfare, such as skip, ship, and Viking, a Norse word itself, were adopted into Old Frisian. The political instability caused by the Viking invasions also contributed to the further divergence between Old Frisian and Old Dutch. While the Frisians were dealing with the constant threat of Viking raids, the southern Netherlands was becoming more politically stable under the rule of the Frankish kings. The Viking raids in the south were less frequent and less devastating than in the north, allowing the cities of Flanders and Brabant to continue their economic and cultural development. This period also saw the rise of powerful city-states in the southern Netherlands, particularly in Flanders, where towns like Bruges, Ghent, and Ypres became centers of trade and commerce. These cities were connected to the wider European trade network, and their wealth and political influence helped to solidify the position of Old Dutch as a language of administration and trade. In contrast, the Frisian language continued to be spoken primarily in rural areas and small coastal towns. The Frisian islands, which were heavily impacted by Viking raids, became increasingly isolated, and the language began to develop regional dialects. These dialects, which were influenced by contact with Danish and Norse-speaking traders, began to diverge from the old Frisian spoken on the mainland. One of the most important developments during this period was the increasing use of Latin as the language of the church and education. In both the Frisian and Dutch-speaking regions, Latin was the dominant written language, and it was used in religious texts, legal documents, and academic writings. However, the common people continued to speak their native languages, and Old Frisian and Old Dutch remained the languages of everyday life for the majority of the population. The 11th and 12th centuries saw a period of relative stability in Northern Europe, and this allowed both the Frisian and Dutch languages to develop further. In Friesland, the Frisians managed to maintain a degree of political autonomy despite pressure from the neighboring Dutch-speaking regions. The Frisians were known for their fierce independence, and they resisted attempts by external powers, including the Holy Roman Empire, to impose control over their territory. During this period, the Frisians developed a unique system of governance known as the Frisian Freedom. This system was based on a tradition of local self-governance, and it allowed the Frisian people to maintain their autonomy without the need for a centralized monarchy. The Frisian freedom was enshrined in a series of legal codes, written in Old Frisian, that governed everything from property rights to criminal law. The Frisian language continued to be used in legal and administrative contexts, and it became a symbol of Frisian identity and independence. The legal documents from this period provide valuable insights into the structure and vocabulary of Old Frisian, and they show that the language was still closely related to other Germanic languages, such as Old English and Old Dutch. Meanwhile, in the southern Netherlands, Old Dutch was becoming increasingly standardized. The rise of powerful city-states in Flanders and Brabant, combined with the growing influence of the Catholic Church, helped to solidify the position of Old Dutch as a language of trade and governance. The cities of Flanders, in particular, were becoming economic powerhouses, and their wealth and influence helped to spread the Dutch language across the southern Low Countries. One of the most important cultural developments during this period was the growth of Dutch literature. The earliest Dutch literary texts, such as religious hymns and epic poetry, were written in Old Dutch and reflect the growing cultural identity of the Dutch-speaking people. These texts also show the influence of Latin and French on the Dutch language, as many of the authors were educated in monastic schools where Latin was the primary language of instruction. By the 13th century, the linguistic landscape of the Low Countries was shifting. In the southern Netherlands, Old Dutch was evolving into what is known as Middle Dutch, while in the north, the once vibrant Old Frisian language was beginning to lose ground due to political changes. This chapter covers a pivotal period in the history of both languages, as we see the rise of the Dutch-speaking city-states and the decline of Frisian political and linguistic influence. In the southern provinces, particularly in Flanders, Brabant, and Holland, the economy was booming. 
cities such as Bruges, Ghent, and Antwerp became key centers of trade, attracting merchants from across Europe. This period, often called the High Middle Ages, saw the emergence of Middle Dutch as a major language of commerce, culture, and governance. Middle Dutch was spoken in many dialects across the region, but it was slowly becoming more standardized, particularly in the cities where trade and government required clear communication. Middle Dutch still retained many features of its Germanic roots, but it was increasingly influenced by the French language. Flanders, in particular, had close cultural and political ties to the French-speaking world. Many of the ruling elites in Flanders and Brabant spoke both French and Dutch, and the two languages were used interchangeably in some legal and administrative contexts. This French influence introduced new vocabulary into Middle Dutch, particularly in the fields of law, government, and literature. This period also saw the growth of Dutch literature, with texts written in Middle Dutch becoming more widespread. Religious texts, epic poetry, and even early works of fiction were written in Middle Dutch, marking the emergence of Dutch as a literary language. One of the most famous works from this period is The Whale Wine, an epic poem about the knight Garwin from Arthurian legend, written in Middle Dutch. The rise of Dutch literature helped to standardize the language, as writers and scribes began to develop more consistent rules for spelling and grammar. In contrast to the growing influence of Middle Dutch, Old Frisian was in decline. The political independence of the Frisian people, which had been a defining feature of their culture for centuries, was beginning to erode. By the late 13th century, the Frisian territories were coming under increasing pressure from the county of Holland to the west and the Holy Roman Empire to the east. The Frisians managed to maintain their autonomy for much of this period, but they were increasingly isolated, both politically and linguistically. While Old Frisian remained the language of the common people in rural areas, Dutch was beginning to make inroads in the towns and cities of Friesland. The rising influence of Holland, where Middle Dutch was the dominant language, led to a gradual shift in the linguistic landscape of Friesland. Dutch became the language of administration and trade, while Frisian was relegated to the status of a rural dialect. Despite these pressures, Old Frisian continued to be used in legal contexts, particularly in the form of the Frisian laws. These legal texts, written in Old Frisian, were a testament to the resilience of the Frisian language and culture. However, by the 14th century, it was clear that Old Frisian was being overshadowed by Dutch, and the language was beginning to lose its prominence in the public sphere. The 14th and 15th centuries were a time of great economic and political change in Northern Europe. One of the most significant developments during this period was the rise of the Hanseatic League, a powerful trading alliance that dominated the commerce of the North Sea and the Baltic Sea. The Hanseatic League included many cities along the Frisian and Dutch coasts, and it played a crucial role in shaping the linguistic and cultural landscape of the region. Frisian merchants were heavily involved in the trade networks of the Hanseatic League, and their language became an important tool for communication between traders from different parts of Northern Europe. The Frisian language, particularly in its maritime dialects, was widely spoken in the coastal towns of Friesland, Denmark, and northern Germany. Frisian sailors and traders played a key role in connecting the economies of the North Sea region, and their language spread along the coast as a result. However, the growing influence of Dutch-speaking cities, such as Amsterdam and Rotterdam, began to challenge Frisian dominance in the maritime trade. These Dutch-speaking cities became major players in the Hanseatic League, and their economic power helped to spread the Dutch language across the northern Low Countries. As Dutch merchants became more prominent in the Hanseatic trade, Middle Dutch began to displace Frisian as the lingua franca of the North Sea. This shift had a significant impact on the Frisian language. While Frisian remained the dominant language in rural areas and small towns, Dutch was becoming increasingly important in trade and administration. Many Frisian merchants and sailors were bilingual, speaking both Frisian and Dutch, and this bilingualism further contributed to the decline of Frisian as a language of commerce. In the southern Netherlands, the rise of the Hanseatic League also contributed to the growth of Middle Dutch as a language of trade and diplomacy.
cities like Bruges, Ghent, and Antwerp were key members of the Hanseatic League, and their economic influence helped to spread the Dutch language across Europe. Middle Dutch was increasingly used in legal and administrative documents, and it became the dominant language of the urban elites in the southern provinces. The economic power of the Dutch-speaking cities in the Hanseatic League helped to solidify the position of Dutch as a major European language. By the late 15th century, Dutch was not only the language of the common people, but also the language of trade, diplomacy, and governance in the southern Low Countries. This period marked the beginning of Dutch's rise to prominence as one of the most important languages in Europe. The 16th century was a transformative period for Europe, marked by the rise of humanism, the Renaissance, and profound cultural and intellectual changes. This period was crucial for the Dutch language as it began to take its modern form, and a process of standardization slowly took hold, particularly in the burgeoning Dutch-speaking cities of the southern Low Countries. At the same time, Frisian continued to develop in the north, though it faced increasing pressure from the expanding influence of Dutch. The invention of the printing press by Johannes Gutenberg around 1440 had a revolutionary impact on language across Europe. In the Low Countries, the widespread availability of books and pamphlets allowed for the greater dissemination of ideas, and the Dutch language became more widely written and read. Texts that had once been the exclusive domain of Latin, such as religious treatises, scientific works, and even fiction, began to be translated into Dutch. This marked a major turning point in the standardization of the language, as the written form of Dutch started to become more unified. One of the key figures of this period was Desiderius Erasmus of Rotterdam, born in 1466. Erasmus was a towering intellectual of the Renaissance and a leading figure in the humanist movement. Though he wrote primarily in Latin, his work laid the foundation for a growing body of Dutch literature that was based on principles of clarity, logic, and reason. His emphasis on the written word helped shape the future of the Dutch language, especially as Dutch began to replace Latin in more and more domains of public life. Erasmus calls for reforms in the Catholic Church and his ideas about education spread widely, partly thanks to the rise of printing. Although Erasmus himself was cautious about the Reformation, the Dutch-language Bible translations that followed the Reformation were essential in further standardizing Dutch. William of Orange, who led the Dutch revolt against the Spanish Habsburg rulers in the late 16th century, used Dutch as a rallying point for political and religious identity, reinforcing its role as the language of the burgeoning Dutch Republic. The most significant event for Dutch linguistic standardization during this period came with the Staten Bible, the state's Bible. This translation of the Bible into Dutch, published in 1637, was commissioned by the Synod of Dordrecht in 1618 to 1619. The Staten Bible was written in a standardized form of Dutch, which was based on the Hollandic dialect but also incorporated elements from other regional dialects to make it accessible to Dutch speakers across the provinces. It was the first translation that was widely accepted by both the Reformed Church and the general public, and it had an enormous influence on Dutch literature and the Dutch language as a whole. The Staten Bible became the standard text in churches across the Dutch Republic, and it was also used in schools, ensuring that its standardized form of Dutch was passed down to future generations. As Dutch became more standardized in the south, the Frisian language in the north was facing increased pressure. The Dutch-speaking regions of the Republic of the Seven United Provinces, which was established in 1581, began to exert political and cultural influence over Friesland, where Frisian had traditionally been spoken. Dutch increasingly became the language of administration, trade, and education in Friesland, particularly in the towns and cities. This caused Frisian to retreat further into rural areas, where it remained the language of the common people but was no longer used in official contexts. Despite this pressure, Frisian was not entirely eclipsed by Dutch. In rural areas, Frisian continued to be spoken, and it maintained a strong presence in the everyday lives of the people. However, the dominance of Dutch in the political and cultural spheres meant that Frisian did not undergo the same process of standardization that Dutch did during the 16th and 17th centuries.
While Dutch was becoming a unified, standardized language with a rich literary tradition, Frisian was increasingly marginalized and fragmented into various regional dialects. The 17th century was a period of unprecedented growth and prosperity for the Dutch Republic, often referred to as the Dutch Golden Age. The Republic became one of the wealthiest and most powerful states in Europe, and Dutch culture, science, and art flourished. The Dutch language solidified its place as the language of trade, diplomacy, and high culture, not only within the Republic, but also across Europe and the world, as Dutch merchants and explorers traveled to Asia, Africa, and the Americas. One of the most visible expressions of Dutch cultural dominance during this period was the rise of Dutch art. Artists such as Rembrandt van Rijn, Johannes Vermee, and Frans Hals produced works that became iconic symbols of the Dutch Golden Age. Their paintings depicted everyday scenes of Dutch life, portraits of merchants, seascapes, domestic interiors, and were accompanied by a flourishing literary culture. The works of Dutch poets and playwrights, such as Joost van den Vondel, Constantij Huygens, and P.C. Hooft, became widely read and helped to solidify the Dutch language as a literary force. At the same time, Dutch merchants and explorers were establishing trade routes and colonies around the world, from Indonesia and Japan to South Africa and Brazil. The Dutch East India Company, a VOC, and the Dutch West India Company played central roles in this global expansion, and Dutch became a lingua franca in many parts of the world, particularly in the trading posts and colonies established by the Dutch Republic. While Dutch was expanding its global influence, the Frisian language was increasingly marginalized. The economic and cultural dominance of the Dutch-speaking cities in the south meant that Dutch was becoming the default language of education, governance, and commerce, even in Friesland. Frisian remained the spoken language of many rural communities, but it was no longer used in official contexts. Frisian literature, which had once flourished in the Middle Ages, saw a significant decline during this period. The decline of Frisian influence was not just linguistic, but also political. The Republic of the Seven United Provinces was dominated by the wealthy merchant class of Holland, and while Friesland retained its own provincial government, it was largely overshadowed by the power and wealth of the Dutch-speaking provinces to the south. As a result, Frisian identity became more regional and less politically or culturally prominent on the national stage. Despite this decline, there were efforts to preserve the Frisian language and culture. In rural Friesland, Frisian continued to be passed down from generation to generation, and it remained the language of everyday life for many people. However, without the same level of institutional support as Dutch, Frisian remained a primarily spoken language, with little written literature or formal education in the language. The 18th century brought the Enlightenment, a period of intellectual and philosophical development that emphasized reason, science, and individualism. This period had a profound impact on the development of Dutch, as the language became increasingly associated with education, science, and progress. The Dutch-speaking provinces, particularly Holland, were at the forefront of Enlightenment thinking, with philosophers such as Baruch Spinoza and scientists like Christian Huygens making significant contributions to European thought. The Enlightenment also saw the rise of the bourgeoisie in Dutch society, as merchants, bankers, and other members of the middle class became the dominant political and economic force in the Republic. The Dutch language reflected this shift, as it became associated with modernity, commerce, and scientific advancement. Dutch universities, such as the University of Leiden, became centers of learning, where Dutch and Latin were used interchangeably in scientific and philosophical discourse. During this time, Frisian continued to decline in status. The language was increasingly seen as a rural dialect, spoken only by the uneducated peasants of Friesland. However, there were some efforts to revive Frisian as a cultural language. A small group of Frisian intellectuals, influenced by the Enlightenment ideals of education and cultural heritage, began to write in Frisian again, producing poetry and prose that celebrated Frisian identity and history. These early efforts at Frisian revival were limited in scope, but they laid the groundwork for future linguistic revival movements in the 19th and 20th centuries.
the Frisian language was not dead, it was still spoken by a significant portion of the population, but it lacked the institutional support and literary tradition that Dutch had developed over the centuries. As a result, Frisian remained largely a spoken language, with little formal education or literature to support its use in official contexts. The Napoleonic Wars and the subsequent occupation of the Netherlands by France in the late 18th and early 19th centuries had a profound impact on the political and linguistic landscape of the region. In 1795, the Batavian Republic was established under French control, and this marked the end of the Dutch Republic. Friesland, which had retained some degree of autonomy within the Republic, was fully integrated into the new French-controlled state. Under French rule, Dutch became the official language of the entire region, including Friesland. French was also used in government and administration, but Dutch remained the dominant language of education and public life. This further marginalized Frisian, which was now seen as a provincial dialect with little political or cultural relevance. The Napoleonic period also saw the introduction of new laws and administrative structures that further centralized control over the provinces, including Friesland. The traditional Frisian system of local governance was replaced by a more centralized bureaucracy, which operated primarily in Dutch. This shift further eroded the status of Frisian as a language of governance and education. Despite these challenges, Frisian continued to be spoken in rural areas, and the language retained its cultural significance for the people of Friesland. The 19th century would eventually see a revival of interest in Frisian language and culture, as part of a broader movement of regional and national identity that swept across Europe in the wake of the Napoleonic Wars. The 19th century marked a pivotal time for both Frisian and Dutch, as European countries experienced significant social, political, and cultural transformations brought about by industrialization, the rise of nationalism, and the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars. For the Dutch language, this century represented the further consolidation of Dutch national identity, while for Frisian, it marked the beginning of a cultural and linguistic revival aimed at preserving and promoting the language. As the Kingdom of the Netherlands was established in 1815 after the defeat of Napoleon, Dutch was solidified as the official language of the newly unified state. The Dutch monarchy, under King William I, sought to strengthen national identity by promoting Dutch as the language of government, education, and commerce across the kingdom, including the southern regions that would later become Belgium. Dutch became synonymous with modernization and progress, reflecting the broader movements of industrialization and the establishment of national education systems across Europe. For Frisian, the 19th century presented a very different story. The language had largely retreated into rural areas, and while still widely spoken by the Frisian people, it had little presence in formal education or government. However, there was growing concern among Frisian intellectuals that their language and culture were at risk of disappearing entirely due to the dominance of Dutch. This sparked the beginning of what is known as the Frisian Revival. The Frisian Revival was part of a broader European trend of regionalist movements, where smaller linguistic and cultural groups sought to assert their identities within larger nation-states. In Friesland, intellectuals and writers began to focus on preserving the Frisian language and revitalizing Frisian culture. The Frisian Society for History and Culture was founded in 1827 and played a key role in promoting Frisian language and history. This society, along with other regional organizations, sought to document and celebrate Frisian literature, folklore, and traditions. One of the most important figures of this movement was Gisbert Japix, 1603-1666, whose earlier works became central to the Frisian revival in the 19th century. Japix was a poet and writer from the 17th century, and his use of Frisian in literature was seen as an important example for later generations. His works were rediscovered and republished during the 19th century, inspiring a new generation of Frisian writers who sought to create a modern Frisian literary tradition. Throughout the century, more books, poems, and plays were written in Frisian, and these efforts slowly gained public recognition. Yet despite these cultural achievements, Frisian faced significant challenges. Dutch remained the language of education and government, 
and for most of the population, learning frizzy and beyond basic communication was not seen as economically or socially advantageous. While the cultural elite embraced Frisian, Dutch dominated in the cities, and bilingualism became more common. At the same time, Dutch nationalism was growing stronger. The Netherlands was undergoing rapid modernization, driven by industrialization and urbanization. The expansion of railways, factories, and trade transformed the Dutch economy, and as more people moved to cities, the need for a standardized, widely understood national language became even more pressing. The Dutch education system was reformed in 1806, and the introduction of compulsory primary education in 1901 cemented Dutch as the language of instruction for most of the population. While Dutch nationalism celebrated the unity of the Dutch-speaking provinces, Frisian identity was rooted in regional pride and a desire to maintain cultural independence. For many Frisians, their language became a symbol of resistance against the homogenizing forces of Dutch nationalism. The revivalists promoted the idea that Frisian was not just a dialect but a fully-fledged language, worthy of respect and preservation. As we move into the late 19th and early 20th centuries, both Dutch and Frisian were shaped by significant changes in education, politics, and social movements. In the Netherlands, the Dutch language became more firmly embedded in the educational system, while in Friesland, the struggle for Frisian language rights became a key part of the regional identity. The Netherlands' education reforms in the late 19th century were driven by the state's desire to create an educated, literate population. Compulsory primary education, introduced in 1901, ensured that all Dutch children received a formal education. However, this education was conducted almost exclusively in Dutch, even in regions where Frisian was widely spoken. This policy reflected the belief that Dutch was the language of progress and modernity, while Frisian was viewed as a regional dialect, not suitable for academic or professional use. For the Frisian people, these policies were problematic. Many Frisians were bilingual, speaking both Frisian and Dutch, but their native language was being sidelined in favour of Dutch. The lack of Frisian in schools was a major concern for Frisian cultural advocates, who feared that the younger generation would lose their connection to the language. The movement to promote Frisian in education began to gather momentum, as activists called for Frisian to be recognized as a legitimate language of instruction in schools. This period also saw the rise of new Frisian literary figures, who helped to reinvigorate the Frisian language and culture. One of the most influential was Dao Karma, 1896-1953, a poet and writer who became a leading voice in the Frisian movement during the early 20th century. Karma founded the Frisian Youth League in 1915, which aimed to promote Frisian language and culture among the younger generation. He believed that Frisian should be taught in schools and that it should have equal status with Dutch in public life. Karma's efforts, along with those of other Frisian activists, eventually led to important changes. In 1937, the Dutch government granted limited recognition to Frisian in schools, allowing it to be taught as a subject in primary schools in Friesland. This was a major victory for the Frisian movement, as it marked the first time that Frisian was officially recognized as a language of education. At the same time, the Dutch language was continuing to evolve and modernize. The expansion of Dutch into international trade, science, and diplomacy meant that it was becoming an increasingly important global language. Dutch universities, such as those in Leiden and Utrecht, were producing influential scholars in a range of fields, and Dutch language publications were being read across Europe. The Dutch language also underwent a process of internal standardization during this period. The advent of mass media, particularly newspapers and radio, helped to spread a standardized form of Dutch across the country. The regional dialects that had once characterized different parts of the Netherlands began to decline as more people adopted the standard Dutch spoken in the media and taught in schools. This process of standardization was less pronounced in Friesland, where Frisian continued to be spoken alongside Dutch. However, the increased use of Dutch in public life meant that more and more Frisians became bilingual, with Frisian being used in informal settings and Dutch in formal contexts.
The period between World War I and World War II saw a rise in Frisian nationalism and language activism, as the people of Friesland sought to protect their linguistic heritage in an increasingly Dutch-dominated society. This was a time of political instability across Europe, and in Friesland, there was growing concern that Frisian culture and language were being marginalized by the central government. Frisian activists, many of whom were inspired by the broader European trend of regionalism and cultural preservation, began to push for greater recognition of Frisian in public life. The Frisian Youth League, founded by Dow Karma, played a central role in this movement, organizing protests, cultural events, and educational campaigns to promote the Frisian language. One of the key goals of Frisian activists was the official recognition of Frisian as a language of instruction in schools. Although Frisian had been allowed as a subject in primary schools since 1937, it was still not recognized as a language of instruction, and Dutch remained the dominant language in the classroom. Activists argued that this policy was contributing to the decline of Frisian, as children were being educated in Dutch and not learning to read or write in their native language. The interwar period also saw a resurgence in Frisian literature, as writers and poets sought to express their cultural identity through the Frisian language. Authors such as O.B. Postma and Ferdinand de Mella Nuenhuis became prominent figures in Frisian literary circles, writing works that celebrated the history, landscape, and traditions of Friesland. Their works were widely read, not only in Friesland, but also in other parts of the Netherlands, where there was growing interest in regional cultures and languages. In the broader context of the Netherlands, Dutch nationalism was also on the rise during this period. The Dutch government, concerned with maintaining national unity in the face of political and economic challenges, promoted Dutch as the language of the nation. This emphasis on Dutch as a unifying force further marginalized regional languages like Frisian, and Frisian activists had to work harder to ensure that their language and culture were not forgotten. The impact of World War II on the Netherlands, including Friesland, was profound. The Nazi occupation of the Netherlands from 1940 to 1945 brought sweeping changes to daily life, politics, and the use of language. Dutch nationalism persisted in the face of occupation, while Frisian identity and language activism were put on hold as survival and resistance to the Nazi regime became paramount. During the occupation, the Dutch language became a symbol of defiance and national unity against the German occupiers. The Frisian language, though not directly suppressed by the Nazis, was marginalized even further as the focus shifted towards the broader struggle for national liberation. However, some resistance movements in Friesland operated underground, including those that sought to preserve Frisian culture and language in secret. This quiet resistance was not only aimed at protecting lives, but also at safeguarding the cultural identity of Friesland, which many felt was at risk during this turbulent period. The war also left deep scars in Friesland, as the province experienced significant disruption. Families were displaced, resources were scarce, and much of the population faced hardship. However, the end of World War II in 1945 brought a renewed sense of hope, and in the post-war years, the Frisian revival gained fresh momentum. After the war, the reconstruction of the Netherlands began in earnest, and alongside this, the Frisian language and culture experienced a resurgence. National rebuilding efforts included reforms in education, and for Frisian activists, this represented a new opportunity to advance their cause. With the Netherlands focusing on rebuilding its national identity, Frisian intellectuals and activists sought to ensure that Friesland's regional identity was not lost. Frisian activism took on new energy in the immediate post-war years. Cultural organizations, such as the Frisian Academy, founded in 1938, played an increasingly important role in promoting Frisian language research, education, and cultural activities. The Frisk Academy worked to document and standardize the Frisian language, ensuring that it would not be relegated to a mere rural dialect, but would continue to be used in literature, education, and public life. The Council of the Frisian Movement, which had been established earlier in the century, also gained new influence after the war.
the Council advocated for the expansion of Frisian language rights and sought to promote Frisian in government, media, and education. One of the key goals of Frisian activists during this period was to ensure that Frisian was recognized as an official language alongside Dutch. This push for linguistic equality gained momentum in the 1950s, leading to important legal changes. In 1956, Frisian was officially recognized as a second language in the Netherlands, a significant victory for Frisian activists. This recognition allowed Frisian to be used in education, public signage, and local government alongside Dutch. It was a major step forward in securing the future of the language, although challenges remained in implementing Frisian language policies on a broader scale. The second half of the 20th century saw further advancements in the recognition and use of Frisian, particularly in education and the media. In Friesland, efforts to incorporate Frisian into the school system became a central focus for language activists. While Frisian had been allowed as a subject in schools since the 1930s, activists sought to expand its role and ensure that Frisian was not only taught as a language but also used as a medium of instruction. By the 1960s, pressure from Frisian organizations and educators resulted in more concrete reforms. Frisian was increasingly introduced as a subject in both primary and secondary schools, and efforts were made to develop Frisian language textbooks and educational materials. However, despite these gains, Dutch remained the dominant language in most schools, and Frisian was often seen as supplementary rather than essential. During this period, the idea of bilingual education gained traction. Activists argued that teaching students in both Frisian and Dutch would help preserve the Frisian language while also ensuring that students could fully participate in Dutch society. Bilingualism was seen as a way to bridge the gap between regional and national identities, allowing Frisian students to maintain their cultural heritage while also achieving fluency in the Dutch language. The introduction of Frisian into the curriculum as a language of instruction in some schools marked a turning point, though the implementation varied across different regions. In addition to education, the media became a key battleground for Frisian language promotion. The post-war period saw the rise of television and radio, and Frisian activists lobbied for the inclusion of Frisian language programming. In 1980, Frisian gained its own dedicated television and radio station, Omrop Frislan, which broadcast news, cultural programs, and entertainment in Frisian. Omrop Frislan played a crucial role in normalizing the use of Frisian in public discourse and reaching a wider audience, particularly in rural areas where Frisian was still spoken by a large portion of the population. The presence of Frisian in the media helped to foster a renewed sense of pride in the language and encouraged younger generations to see Frisian as a living, modern language rather than just a relic of the past. The 1970s and 1980s also saw the growth of Frisian literature, with authors such as Rink van der Velde and Tiny Mulder contributing to a new wave of Frisian language novels, poetry, and plays. These works helped to broaden the scope of Frisian literature, ensuring that the language continued to evolve and thrive in modern contexts. However, challenges remained. Frisian was still seen by many as a regional language, limited in its use outside of Friesland. While there was growing recognition of Frisian within Friesland, it struggled to gain the same level of national recognition as Dutch. This tension between regional pride and national identity continued to shape the linguistic landscape of the Netherlands. The 1990s and early 2000s were a period of significant change for minority languages across Europe, including Frisian. The broader European context of language rights and cultural preservation played a key role in shaping policies toward Frisian in the Netherlands. European institutions, particularly the Council of Europe, began to advocate for the protection and promotion of regional and minority languages as part of the continent's rich cultural diversity. In 1996, the Netherlands signed the European Charter for Regional or Minority Languages, a treaty designed to protect and promote historical regional and minority languages across Europe. This was a major milestone for Frisian, as the Charter recognised Frisian as one of the official minority languages of the Netherlands. The Dutch government committed to taking steps to protect Frisian, 
including ensuring that it could be used in education, media, and public life. The European Charter brought new momentum to the Frisian language movement. Frisian activists continued to push for greater use of Frisian in official settings, including courts, local government, and healthcare. The Charter also encouraged the development of bilingual education programs, which allowed Frisian to be used more widely as a medium of instruction in schools. In the media, Frisian continued to grow in prominence. Omrop Frislin expanded its programming to include more news, documentaries, and cultural programs in Frisian, and the station played a key role in keeping Frisian relevant in a rapidly changing media landscape. Frisian language newspapers and magazines also became more popular, and the rise of the internet allowed Frisian speakers to connect in new ways, creating online communities dedicated to promoting the language. The legal recognition of Frisian as a minority language within the European framework was a significant victory, but it also highlighted ongoing challenges. While Frisian was widely spoken in rural areas, its use in urban centres was declining. Younger generations, in particular, were increasingly bilingual in Dutch and Frisian, with many choosing to use Dutch in public life. This trend raised concerns about the future vitality of the language, particularly in the face of globalization and the dominance of Dutch in education and media. As we move into the 21st century, both Frisian and Dutch continue to play important roles in the cultural and linguistic landscape of the Netherlands. Dutch remains the dominant language of the nation, used in government, education, media, and commerce, while Frisian retains its status as a recognized minority language, primarily spoken in Friesland. The challenges facing Frisian today are similar to those faced by many regional languages across Europe. While Frisian is still spoken by a large portion of the population in Friesland, the increasing dominance of Dutch in public life and the global influence of English present significant hurdles for the long-term vitality of the Frisian language. Younger generations, in particular, are growing up in a more interconnected world, where Dutch and English are often seen as more useful for career advancement and social mobility. However, the Frisian language movement remains strong, and there are ongoing efforts to ensure that Frisian continues to be a vibrant part of the cultural fabric of Friesland. Bilingual education programs have expanded, and Frisian is now taught in more schools than ever before. The rise of digital media has also provided new opportunities for promoting Frisian, with Frisian language content available on social media, streaming platforms, and websites. In 2014, the Dutch government signed a new administrative agreement with the province of Friesland, further strengthening the position of Frisian in education and public life. This agreement built on the commitments made under the European Charter for Regional or Minority Languages and provided additional funding for Frisian language education, media, and cultural projects. Looking ahead, the future of Frisian depends on continued efforts to promote the language among younger generations. Language revitalization programs, bilingual education, and cultural initiatives will be key to ensuring that Frisian remains a living language, used in both everyday life and formal contexts. The challenge is to balance the preservation of Frisian with the realities of a globalized world, where multilingualism is increasingly important. For the Dutch language, the 21st century has brought new opportunities and challenges. As one of the official languages of the European Union and a major language in international trade and diplomacy, Dutch continues to be a significant global language. However, the rise of English as a global lingua franca has led to debates about the role of Dutch in higher education and business. Some universities in the Netherlands now offer courses in English, raising questions about the future of Dutch as the language of academia. Despite these challenges, Dutch remains a strong and vital language, with a rich literary and cultural tradition. The relationship between Dutch and Frisian will continue to evolve as both languages navigate the pressures of globalization, multilingualism, and regional identity in a rapidly changing world.